Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my definitive review of another brand new lens from Sigma. Sigma's really punch, pumping them out right now on the Sony FE platform. This is also available for Leica L, and it is the new uh, Super Telephoto Zoom, the 150 to 600 millimeter, and it is an F5 to 6.3 DNDG OS sport lens. Now, if you don't speak, speak Sigma, let me break that down for you. This is a variable aperture zoom, and, and so it goes from a maximum aperture of F5 to F6.3 on the telephoto end, and it covers the 150, which is about this wide, to the, 100, to the 600 millimeter, which is this narrow uh, angle of view. And and so a DN means that it's designed for mirrorless cameras. DG means it's designed for full frame sensors. OS means it has uh, Sigma's optical stabilizer. And then Sport designates its degree of build. And uh, Sigma has three different degrees of build and design, contemporary and then art and then sports. Sports lenses tend to get their highest degree of weather sealing because I'm out in the rain right now. Uh, they tend to be lenses that are going to be used out in, um, you know, variable conditions. So for either sporting events, for wildlife, you know, the kind of things that happen outdoors. And so this is a lens that has a good degree of weather sealing as a part of it. And I was in many ways a fan of the 150 to 600 millimeter sport lens that was designed for DSLRs, Canon EF and Nikon F. And I tested that several years ago. I really liked the image quality it got and the degree of build. What I didn't like is it was a really, really heavy lens. And also not just a heavy lens, but it had a lot of weight at its maximum zoom. It had a lot of weight out here. And so when you're supporting it on the camera, it always felt like you were supporting a lot of weight away from your body, which tends to be the most difficult way to, uh, to support that kind of weight. Fortunately, uh, Sigma has managed to trim the fat here. And so we have got a uh, somewhat smaller but significantly lighter lens that I don't find any of the same kind of balance issues that I did before. It's a much easier lens to use in the field. And of course, it's a very welcome addition to what is a growing catalog of telephoto zooms that take you well out beyond 200 millimeters, which was an area of, of serious need going back a couple of years ago. But fortunately, there have been a lot of lenses that have come to help to fill that void. And then the last few years, we've seen standouts like uh, Sony's own 200 to 600 millimeter uh, G lens. We've seen Sigma's 100 to 400 millimeter uh, DN lens. We've seen Tamron's very recent 150 to 500 millimeter um, VC lens. And then of course, this new Sigma. So all of these, of course, are very welcome. But it also means that Sigma is coming into what has become a much more competitive marketplace. And so it has to compete somewhat on merit, though it does give have one automatic baked in advantage or really two that I should point to. The first of those is the fact that this is the biggest zoom ratio of any of these lenses at this point. And so it takes you all the way from 150 to 600 millimeters. And so that's a full four times zoom ratio, which is shared, yes, by the 100 to 400 millimeter lenses. But it's obviously more significant when you're reaching all the way to 600 millimeters. And so the Sony lens starts at 200 millimeters. So you lose 50 millimeters there. The Tamron lens starts at 150 millimeters, but ends at 500 millimeters, meaning that Sigma has a 100 millimeter ad uh, advantage on the telephoto end. The other advantage that it has, at least relative to the Sony, is price. This is priced at the same point as the Tamron uh, at 1399, 1400 US dollars. And so that competes obviously strongly against the Sony at its $2,000 price point. So 600 extra dollars there that you know you can keep in your pocket, which means that this is a lens that can be afforded by some people who could not afford the more significantly expensive Sony lens. So some good things going in. Today's definitive review is about breaking down the details and seeing if this lens holds up under more intense scrutiny in various aspects of its performance. Today's episode is brought to you by Phantom Wallet, the minimalist modern wallet that sets you free from the bulky traditional wallet while also making it easy to access your cards and money when you need them thanks to their unique fanning mechanism. Visit phantomwallet.com to check out their unique sizes, styles, and finishes that span from aluminum to wood to carbon fiber. You can even customize your wallet with new accessories like a money clip, cash holder, ID display, and even the Chipolo tracking integration if you're the kind of person who loses their wallet.
Use code DUSTIN15 for 15% off when you're ready to check out. Now, if you want a briefer uh, review more to the point, you can check out my standard review instead. But today we're going to start off by diving in and taking a closer look at the build and the feature, the design. This is a lens that's not really like anything that Sigma has done to this point on the Sony platform. Just a little bit more of an extreme instrument. The 100 to 400 lens, they branded under their contemporary branding, which means it doesn't get all the features and all of the performance that this lens does. So let's dive in and let's take a look. So the first thing to notice is that all of Sigma's lenses come in these nice cases. In this case, we've got a very large padded case, but it does have a carrying strap and even a padded section so you can carry it with in comfort. Now also included is a couple of choices for how to approach the uh, kind of a lens cap. You do have this kind of nylon uh, cover that goes over the top. And if it's reversed and you can use this locking knob on the lens hood, to reverse it, uh, well, to take it off, to lock it, whatever. But also if you want to reverse it for storage, you can set it down there and then lock the hood in place. And then this uh, nylon cap can go over that and uh, can be used like that with a little spot for the locking knob to stick out. Also in the box included though is a traditional pinch cap that you can use here as well. The lens hood itself is uh, fairly lightweight. It does have that rubberized surface on it that um, will allow you to kind of store the lens upside down as I've got the Sony over there. And so, you know, very often this is the most stable way to, you know, to stand a lens like this, much less secure standing it on the, the rear cap here. So we have a weather sealed lens with, um, they call it dust and moisture resistant. And so you've got a thick gasket here at the lens mount, some seals throughout. A nice mix of materials here in the build. And so that includes um, when it comes to the actual tripod area, some magnesium alloy, there's an aluminum alloy throughout. And then in a few key spots, there is, you know, there are engineered plastics. Um, so like they call them thermal compo composites. But overall, what they've done is they've managed to keep Keep the weight down relative to the old 150 to 600 and also to make a little bit more compact lens just give you an idea of that weight dis difference the original 150 to 600 sport was a really heavy lens it weighed in at nearly three kilograms uh, 2860 grams this new one by comparison is 2100 grams so that's a significant difference and i'll tell you using it in the field there's a huge difference in the weight distribution and how much weight is out here away from the uh, you know when you're holding it away from your body I'll also note here that we have a 95 millimeter front element instead of 105 millimeter. And so that helps to make the lens a little bit more compact as well. Is a lens that's about 37 millimeters shorter. The uh, sport lens was 290 millimeters. This is 263.6 millimeters. And so it's a little bit more compact all around. 109 millimeters in diameter instead of 121 millimeters. So we've got a more compact lens and a much lighter lens. And I would say that in some ways the light part is you know, arguably the most important. A few other design elements to highlight here is that our tripod collar is rotatable but not removable. You can remove and replace the tripod foot, um, but that is not a toolless operation. They include an Allen key. It's four Allen keys that would need to be taken loose. What they do have is nice detents at the cardinal positions to help to make sure that you've got everything you know, lined up properly for that. And the tripod foot itself is Arca Swiss compatible. And as I've pointed out previously, the Sony 200 to 600, its tripod foot is not Arca compatible, which is frankly ridiculous. Now the size difference between the Sigma and the Sony is not as dramatic as what we saw with the Tamron. Uh, this is definitely a larger lens. In fact, it's about 54 millimeters longer than what the Tamron was. And more noticeably here that if you zoom it out to the full 600 millimeters and I lock it there, it's actually a longer lens than what the Sony is, though obviously it is still uh, a fair bit shorter when it's in its fully retracted position. The uh, Sony is 318 millimeters long. And so, you know, that is a significant, a uh, near 60 millimeters difference. And so um, that obviously is going to be a factor for transporting. You will be able to fit this lens, the Sigma, into some areas that you cannot fit the Sony into. And so that's going to be a relevant point. 
Like the Sony and unlike the Tamron, you do have three different focus hold uh, position, uh, button positions. And so those can, uh, obviously that button can be programmed to a different functionality, but you have a kind of a similar uh, setup to that. Now, Sigma is touting this new um, LTS switch here. And so basically what it, it does is it either allows you to have a smooth uh, zoom without any kind of resistance. And as you can see, uh, there's definitely not a lot of resistance there. And so you will get near instantaneous zoom creep um, if you have that position engaged. There's also a tight position that you can switch into. And there, there's a lot more tension on the ring. And so it will hold a position, but it's also gonna be less easy to use in the field in terms of, you know, if you need to make a rotation. And then finally, there is a lock position, but the lock position is only a locking at 150 millimeters. You're gonna to wanna to use the tight setting um, in other settings to help to hold a kind of position. Now, what Sigma does tout is that this can also be used as a push-pull, and it's going to be actually a lot faster to make your full zoom, because if you're gonna twist it, you actually have to do a couple of full rotations to get there. That's an area where the Sony is just so much nicer um, you know, it's internally zooming. And so you can just zoom very quickly in the field. It's one of my favorite things about using that lens out in the field. So I don't actually love this new thing. I actually prefer uh, Tamron's uh, new kind of locking mechanism where you can actually use it like in a clutch and you can just lock any position like that. And of course, best of all is the Sony where you don't have to worry about any of that at all. Down here, you have four different um, uh, switches here, an AFMF switch, which is a little bit larger than the next three. The next three are actually a little bit on the small side, and it's because even though this is a big lens, it's a little bit tight in this particular area. And so you've got a three position focus limiter, full uh, 10 meters to infinity, and then uh, minimum focus to 10 meters. You also have a three position uh, switch here for the optical stabilizer, the OS. And so you've got one, which is standard, two for panning, and then you can turn it off. Now, interestingly, here you have a custom button as the fourth button. On a Leica, you can actually program that, and you don't actually have that option here because there isn't an available USB dock on Sony. And so you're kind of set with the default positions. And so they actually end up being more uh, different positions for the behavior of the optical stabilizer. So C1 gives you a noticeable improvement in how much stability you have in the viewfinder, while C2 will actually uh, can change the viewfinder behavior less, but give you a little bit more um, kind of a, a live view where things move around more, but give you a little bit more stabilization at capture. If you're shooting video, try out the C1 setting. It does do a nice job of stabilizing. And the optical stabilizer, it's rated at four stops, but it seems to do a fairly good job. I would say a little bit better than what Tamron did. It's hard to say if it cooperates with the in-body image stabilization, as there's no way to decouple those two things. If you turn OS off here, um, IBIS is turned off in the camera. And if it's on, in the lens, it's on in the camera, so you have no way of kind of getting away from that. Overall, though, this is a nicely made functional lens that I like basically everything about, uh, save I don't love their approach to the actual locking or adding friction to the zoom ring. So a lot of good things there, and I think to me one of the, the very key things here is that this is a lens that just has a much better balance than what the sport lens did on DSLRs. And I think that people are going to be able to appreciate the fact that you can, you know, use it as a push-pull type design. And frankly, uh, I would develop the muscle memory to use it that way. It's much quicker than doing the twist. Uh, the twist, you know, takes you a couple of you know, good rotations to get all the way there. Now, at the same time, I recognize that there are some of you that will prefer, uh, you know, the slightly more compact design here relative to the Sony. But others of you are going to prefer the fact that the Sony is an internally zooming lens. It's a very different kind of design philosophy, but many people feel like it does, you know, it has certain advantages like weather sealing. There's less opportunity for, you know, uh, dust particles to be brought in. But really that's what the seals are designed for. And so I'm hoping that the Sigma proves resilient to a dust and moisture intrusion into it due to having a good degree of weather sealing. 
So how about the autofocus? Autofocus in many ways is perhaps most critical in a lens like this. I have found that recently due to amazing IAF technology and some of the most recent mirrorless cameras, almost all the lenses that I am using work really well when it comes for, for example, portrait work. And, and it's been a while since I've tested a lens that gave me really inconsistent results when it came to portrait work, uh, certainly not on Canon or Sony platforms where it's just really, really reliable. In this case, however, we're not just wanting to be able to get good results at, you know, slowly moving or, you know, a stationary subjects. We're looking at, you know, capturing really fast action. And so this deserves its own a little bit more careful kind of examination. So let's take a look at that. So let's talk autofocus. I'm filming on the 150 to 600 DN mounted on my Sony Alpha 1 right now. So it does give you at least a little bit of a look at how it would do for a setting like this, though you know, obviously this is kind of a long uh, lens for this type of work. Now Sigma has designed an autofocus system that has a, an actuator that's powered in their language by a stepping motor and not a, I haven't been able to see any kind of diagram of you know what the focusing elements are and how it's actually designed. But it seems to be a, you know, kind of their version of a lot of different systems that we're seeing from various manufacturers on Sony right now, designed around, you know, these kind of higher end stepping or linear type motors that uh, drive focus groups. And so in this case, uh, focus is like, as I've been seeing on all of these uh, Sigma DN lenses, it tends to be fast, it tends to be very quiet, and it also tends to be accurate in operation. And so for most types of photography, I have been just nothing but pleased with the um, the performance that I'm seeing out of this lens. And likewise for uh, shooting video, for example, if I approach the the lens itself while it's filming you can see that it does a good job of tracking my face and my eye and giving a a good clean transition from one focus point to another with no visible stepping so you know a lot of good things happening on that front i also found that there was enough focus speed that in a variety of situations i was able to catch birds in flight and track them without any kind of problem and even this particular image even though the bird is not really in the frame it goes to show that it's an accurately focused Results. So it goes to show that even though I didn't have time to really get the camera up in time to get the photo that I wanted, that even in that split second opportunity I had, you know, to uh, to pull the trigger, so to speak, that it at least was able to, you know, almost instantly autofocus and get an accurately focused result, even if I didn't quite get the framing that I was looking for in the shot. And so for all of those kind of things, I was really, really satisfied. And overall, for my focus results, I was very, very happy. And so I went into my actual uh, tracking test thinking that I was going to get a really, really strong performance. And, um, but unfortunately, I wasn't as pleased when it came to photographing really high speed action. Enough speed there for bird and flight, but when I did the, the dog type test and I did it side by side with the 200 to 600 uh, G lens from Sony, I found that when I had the Sigma attached that focus always seemed to be lagging just a little bit behind the subject. And so uh, I tended to see kind of a plane of focus that was basically on like the hind legs of the dog, not quite up at the face. And that seemed to be a fairly consistent trim and also I did see a few more like big swings where it went completely out of focus and then you know over the course of several frames focus started to be started coming back and so not as good a performance as I saw even from the Tamron and uh, and but definitely not as good as the Sony 200-600G. And one of the things that, that kind of really stood out to me is that if I looked at individual frames, which I did obviously over hundreds of those, if I did this, you know, Sony burst under the same conditions, actually a little bit more difficult, my dog Bella, not overly cooperative or uh, cooperative for this kind of, of work. And, and so uh, she <laughs> wouldn't hardly stay on track. And so she ran, I wanted to run kind of through the light. She ran, you know, along a, a shadowed area in deeper shadow. And so actually it was not as good a lighting conditions. The shutter speed did drop somewhat uh, to when I was trying to track her with the Sony lens attached. But at the same time, I could zoom into Sony results 
and get the, you know, they would look a little bit more like this, where it's just really beautifully focused and there's great detail, even though you're, fr you know, freezing a, in a split second, uh, a bit of action. It's one of the things I love about Sony's focus systems now and that this lens is that you're able to get these, you know, kind of really pristinely focused results, uh, even right in the midst of very high speed action. And I just didn't find that I could get that the same way with the Sigma. Now there is some possibility that the uh, you know there'll be some firmware updates that will you know maybe get uh, give you a little bit more you know focus accuracy. So our Sigma is having to reverse engineer these focus algorithms. So there is pro pro you know possibly some room for improvement there. But at this point, I can only evaluate what I see, and what I see is that for most types of photography, plenty of speed here does a great job. But if you're you know doing the most discerning high speed action in a sports type setting um, or you know something similar to what I did in tracking an animal that's moving fast towards the camera you might still want to consider the Sony 200 to 600 it's still at another level from these third-party competitors and and certainly that's true when it comes to the Sigma so outside of that I was delighted with what I saw but not for high-speed action Unfortunately, this is an area where the Sigma left me a little bit wanting, at least for the high speed end of the spectrum of action. For most uh, work, I actually th thought it did a really great job. And so I expected a little bit better results when I photographed high speed action. At this stage, at least with the copy I've used and the firmware that I can evaluate at this point, mm, not quite there at the level, certainly not at the Sony level, which is very much a cut above in terms of its absolute performance. And so that's something to keep an eye on, maybe depending on your photography style. If you're just wanting to do birds in flight, I saw no problem there. I got really good results for that. And so, of course, you need to really kind of honestly evaluate what kind of photography work you're doing and determine whether or not that this degree of focus speed is sufficient uh, for your needs. Um, and if you're determined that you need the really kind of the high end spectrum, jump all the way up to the Sony. It's still the best in the class uh, when it comes to that kind of performance. Now, it's a little bit of a different story when it comes to the image quality. And, and what we are finding is there's, there's actually a fair degree of parity here across these top contenders. They're all really, really sharp instruments. And so let me demonstrate that by taking you in depth, checking out the optics of this bad boy. So first of all, this is obviously a very useful uh, focal range, and this is the first time I do want to note on Sony that we have gotten the full uh, four times zoom range of 150 up to the full 600 millimeters. And so you can see that's a tremendous amount of zoom range that really allows you to get in close to the action. Now, when it comes to vignette and distortion, um, I'm reviewing a pre-released copy of the lens, and so there is no profile that's yet available because the lens has not yet been announced. And so as you can see on the 150 millimeter end, there is a little bit of pincushion distortion and uh, not a significant amount. However, I was able to correct it with a minus three and uh, right under a 40 that I, a plus 40 that I added in for correcting vignette. So neither thing is particularly extreme here. Now on the 600 millimeter telephoto end, there is just a just a tiny bit more pincushion distortion. It was a minus four rather than a minus three. Again, statistically really insignificant, easy to correct four as you can see. And just a little bit more uh, vignette, mostly it just kind of goes deeper, penetrates deeper into the frame. And so I used about a plus 60 uh, to correct here, 57, somewhere in that range. And you can see that it cleaned everything up nicely. Now, I didn't really see any kind of significant issue with chromatic aberration. So, for example, here, really high contrast subject, plenty of opportunity for longitudinal chromatic aberration. And as you can see, really not anything there to see. It, everything looks just fine. Likewise, I didn't really see a lot of evidence of lateral chromatic aberration. Everything looks pretty good in these transitions. Just the tiniest amount of fringing there, but not enough for you to pick up in any kind of real world application. This is at 200% here. So all of this adds up to the potential for a nicely sharp lens, and that is what we find. Here at 150 millimeters, 200% magnification, a 50 megapixel Sony Alpha 1 sensor. You can see lots of detail in the center of the frame. And if I zoom up here into the corner, you can see that there is also good corner sharpness, just a little bit of loss of contrast as you go into the you know extreme corner of the frame there. 
Now, as a point of comparison, uh, the chart wasn't identical, as you can see, but uh, the same kind of major pieces here, both shot with the 50 megapixel alpha one. Uh, the one difference was is that the old chart was just the 16-9 ratio, which I shot that in, but it's going to still give us a look at similar type results here. And so uh, this is the uh, this is the Tamron 15500 on the right side. So if we look in the center of the frame and we compare the two lenses, you can see that they are largely similar. The Tamron seems to give ever so slightly a brighter light transmission, but uh, both of them providing very, very good resolution. If we look up into the corner, we can see that the Sigma is the stronger of the two with a little bit better contrast and uh, just holding up a little better as you get out towards the edge of the frame. Now stopping down to f5.6 is only a mild stop down and so don't necessarily expect any kind of major improvement nor do we really see just a little bit better contrast here in the center of the frame and up here in the edge of the frame things look more similar than different I don't see any kind of radical improvement maybe just a hair more contrast at f5.6. Now if we stop on down to f8 you can see a definite improvement in the overall um, contrast here there's also some natural vignette lift but as you can see here things are looking really really crisp at f8 and if we jump back to the center of the frame the difference is less dramatic but you can see some improved contrast in the center of the frame. Now if we move on to 200 millimeters um, we can see that again the results look really fantastic in the center of the frame. I mean that's you know fabulous looking wide open and up into the corner of the frame results also looking really impressively strong. Now at this point I'm going to compare to the uh, the Sony 200 to 600 at 200 millimeters. Now again, same drill as with the Tamron before. It's the older chart, so the ratio is not quite the same, but you know it shows us the same kinds of results. So we can see in the center of the frame, both of them are exceptionally good. I, it's hard for me to call a winner between the two of them. Uh, they both look excellent. Up in the corner, however, I do feel comfortable in saying that the Sigma is a little bit sharper than what the Sony is in the corner of the frame. Stopping down to F8 uh, produces minimal uh, improvement in the center of the frame. It already looked very good, and so it's only mildly improved there. A little bit more obvious improvement, at least in terms of contrast and brightness, if you look up towards the corner of the frame. Here's a real world uh, F8 shot at 200 millimeters. And so you can see as you look towards the, you know, just the, towards the horizon. I mean, look at these, how crisp these two uh, little lawn chairs are sat here in this opening. I mean, we're talking about occupying just a tiny part of the frame and yet they're just rendered really, really crisply. And here, you know, you've got different layers of haze, but you can just see as you look along here that everything is just really, really beautifully rendered. There's a lot of rendering power in this lens. Moving on to 300 millimeters, I've got both f6.3, which is maximum aperture now, and then f8. So uh, looking here at the center of the frame, again, it looks very good wide open. You can see a little bit of improvement in contrast and rendering a stop down to f8. A uh, little bit easier to maybe read some of the writing there on the headband. Uh, you can also see looking up into the corner. Again, it looks awesome um, wide open and just a little bit better contrast when stopped down to f8. It's a similar story here at 400 millimeters and you can see once again detail is very very good. I think ever so slightly less sharp than what I saw at the 300 millimeter range but still very very good and looking up into the corner the corner remains really strong again just slightly better contrast stop down to f8. Just to give you a sense of how that looks in the real world, where you're really shooting kind of more in the sweet spot, here's a shot of Loki, and you can just see that's gorgeous. I mean, the all the fine detail in his fur um, is just beautifully rendered, and on the uh, the whiskers here, you can see no chromatic aberrations that are you know marring that, and so it's a really really impressive lens optically. Now at 500 millimeters, uh, wide open, the result looks a little less sharp than what we have seen uh, up until this point. And at F8, it looks a little bit better, but doesn't have that kind of just biting sharpness that we have seen at uh, earlier focal lengths. That's true up here in the corner where you can just see it's just a little bit more dull looking and even stop down to F8. You just don't have kind of that penetrating look in the eyes that we saw with the crisp results uh, prior to this point. 
If we check back in with the Tamron here at 500 millimeters, you can see that in the center of the frame, the Tamron is obviously sharper and de delivering a, sh you know, just a better end result. And up in the corner, however, that result is not really um, noticeable. They're, they're basically equal there, but certainly the uh, Tamron does show a center improvement, um, just a stronger result. And if we uh, move over towards more of the mid frame, you can see that in the mid frame, the Tamron is stronger there. It just has a little bit more drop off towards the corner of the frame. Now the Sigma regains a little bit more of its sharpness edge back at 600 millimeters where it looks a little bit better than it did at 500 millimeters and stop down to F8, looks quite good. Up in the corner of the frame, it's looking better again, as you can see. And you know, again, better here at F8, not quite to the levels we saw uh, sub uh, 400 millimeters, but close to it. If we check in one more time with the Sony 600 millimeter, we can see that it is delivering, at least in the two comparative copies here, quite obviously sharper results in the center of the frame, uh, comparing the two. And if we look up into the corner of the frame, we can see that the result is less dramatic, but I would still give the edge to the Sony. It's just rendering more of those fine details. You can just see there's a little bit more sparkle and crispness in the rendering here. And if we look into this area here and uh, got to keep aligning things back up you can see that in the mid frame it also is sharper just a little bit more penetrating looking here in the eyes compared to the Sigma at the same time however the Sigma is really delivering very very strong results and once again I think it's always worth after we've looked at charts at 200% to go into the real world and look at you know at more at 100% level and you can see looking at this seagull here I mean the amount of detail that's being rendered there in the feathers and you know contrast there is really really fantastic looking this is the Sigma at 600 millimeters wide open f 6.3 our maximum magnification actually comes at 180 millimeters, kind of an odd point in the zone. But you can see here you're able to get really close and have a very high 0.34 times magnification. And at least in the sweet spot of focus, you can see the amount of detail rendered is really, really fantastic. You can also see that we don't have a perfectly flat plane of focus. There's definitely some you know, pronounced fall off. And so if you backed up a little bit from that, you could actually get a little bit better in result. Just because you would achieve a little bit flatter a plane of focus. Here's a real world result that shows you how close you can get. This is to a marigold blossom. So you can see it's filling the frame pretty well. And while depth of field is vanishingly small, you can see along the edges that are in focus that the detail is nice and crisp. This is a very usable kind of lens for this type of work. We'll return to this uh, image here just for a second because you can see a, you know, a variety of different layers of depth of field. And you can see that really the rendering from the bokeh is quite nice. This is the first time I'm noticing this big spider here. Sorry to uh, freak you out if you hadn't noticed that previously. But you can just see that the bokeh rendering here is quite nice. Another uh, kind of real world shot here. And you can just see, obviously, you're able to really, really compress backgrounds at 600 millimeters. And so, you know, detail looks fantastic there. And the, you know, the fall off of the bokeh looks really, really nice as well. Here's another shot I like to do during the summer, um, you know, with the dew on the grass in the morning. Gives you a little bit of look at the geometry all around, which, you know, there is obviously some cat eye deformation towards the edges of the frame. Fairly normal, though, and we've got good detail here, and the overall bokeh, uh, you know, really looks quite decent. Finally, let's take a look at our flare resistance. And so you can see here, uh, wide open at F5, uh, you can see just mild amount of ghosting artifacts, a little bit of veiling, but overall a fairly strong performance. Uh, stopping down, the ghosting artifacts don't become more obvious, which is a really good sign. And uh, the veiling is maybe ever, ever so slightly more pronounced, but overall, it's really it's a decent performance and the truth be told you're not going to you know point this into the sun all that often in fact if i zoom on in to 305 millimeters i had a hard time even just framing uh in the sun but you can see that i would say the result is better still a little bit more veiling perhaps but overall uh it, the image quality is held up quite good and so as you can see a very strong optical performance and and I, I see really some give and take some strengths and weaknesses of all three of these major contenders at varying points they're all really good lenses optically enough so that i would say that probably doesn't need to be a primary factor in differentiating when you're wanting to determine which of them to buy i still think that 
I would say give the absolute win to the Sony in terms of its, you know, just consistently consistency of optical performance across the frame. I will point out, however, that the Sony is working with a three times zoom ratio while the Sigma is working with a four times zoom ratio. You know, and that can obviously make a difference. Uh, starting at 200 millimeters means that they don't have to, you know, design for the 150 millimeter that Sigma engineers did. And so that could be a factor there. Bottom line, though, is that this is giving you a better performance than any of the 150 to 600 millimeter variants that we saw on DSLRs. It's a great optical performance and it produces really, really beautiful images. And, and so I'm really pleased with, with that overall performance. And of course, the greatest two challenges that Sigma has here is the same ones that I detailed when I covered the Tamron 150 to 500 millimeter. And that is that Sony has imposed some limitations on third parties that show up only when you're talking about these telephoto type lenses. So the first of those is that while the Leica version of this lens does have 1.4 times and two times teleconverters available, on Sony, no teleconverters are available. As Sony has referred, uh, re reserved teleconverters only for Sony branded products. So obviously that's gonna be a limitation. You're stuck using the bare lens, whereas the 200 to 600 millimeter G lens, you can use either the 1.4 or the two times extenders on it. The other limitation is really comes into play only if you're using Sony's higher end sports bodies like the A9 series or the Alpha 1. On those bodies, Sony has capped third party uh, burst rate at 15 frames per second. So not a big deal if you're using an A7 series as that's at the moment at least faster than what you can get anyway. And so you're not gonna see any kind of limitation. If you're shooting an A9, for example, you're gonna get 15 frames per second with the Sigma. Whereas if you have a Sony branded lens attached, you get 20 frames per second. In the case of the Alpha 1, which is what I use, the limitation is even more obvious because you get the 15 frames per second that you can hear here. But if you're using the Sony branded lens, you get 30 frames per second, double the speed. So that's obviously a pretty significant uh, disadvantage, though it's not something that Sigma can do anything about, but it does become a reality if you are a consumer for whom that might be a big deal. And so at the end of the day, it really needs to come down to, you know, your kind of priority. I know that some of you that are watching this are Sigma fans. You like what Sigma does, you like their design. And so if you're one of those kind of people, this is a very logical choice for you. It is priced fantastically. And, you know, I, I'm really kind of brought back to the point that you're getting a similar kind of lens to the Sigma Sport that we saw on DSLRs except for it has better optical performance and it's priced $600 cheaper at its MSRP. And so, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant thing considering that we've seen years of inflation between these two points. And so this is a really incredible value. And so I think, you know, looking at, you know, for example, comparison to the Tamron, that's the same price point. You know, the thing to consider there is that the Tamron's biggest advantage is it's even more compact. If, you know, that's really a priority to you, the Tamron is very tempting. If you want, you know, as much zoom ratio as possible, this obviously gives you more bang for your buck in that regard. And so well worth considering on that point. And then of course, if you want kind of the absolute performer and you're willing to deal with a bigger form factor, the Sony is, you know, it's, it's still the king of the hill in its absolute performance. It's great to have choices though. And so at the end of the day, I'm really, really thankful that Sigma has released this lens and we have another quality option here for the super telephoto end of the spectrum on the Sony platform. I'm Dustin Abbott. And if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review, also an image gallery from this lens. There are buying links there, but as always with the lens that is just being released, some of those merchants are still populating those. And so if you're watching, you know, day one release, Lease. You may have to wait a little while before some of them populate or put a pre-order in through uh, some of the retailers that are already showing a listing. If you're a little bit patient though, uh, those links will all populate in time. Also there you can find linkage to follow me on social media, to become a patron, to sign up for my newsletter. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.